couple of years ago, a student at Stanford University approached me about an idea she had for a nonprofit. She said she wanted to help people in the slums of Cape Town. I said, great, how often do you go to South Africa? She said, oh, I've never been, but I hope to go one day. Here you have a student who is no doubt well-intentioned. She's smart, she's motivated, but how can you solve a problem you've never seen? How can you create programs for people that you've never met? This student had designed a solution without doing the work to understand the problem. And she's not alone. In 2008, when the Chinese earthquake hit Sichuan province, tens of thousands of people died and millions were left homeless. The generosity of the Chinese people was overwhelming. They donated billions of dollars to relief efforts. They waited in long lines to donate blood. They sent relief supplies to the region. But sometimes their efforts to help weren't that helpful. So many people got into their cars to go volunteer that they clogged the tiny mountain roads with traffic. And the streets were lined with piles of useless clothing that people had donated that would never get used. These people meant well, but they didn't take the time to educate themselves about what the earthquake victims really needed. From increasing inequality to climate change, there's no shortage of problems that we must solve in this world. And the good news is there's no shortage of people who want to help solve them. But here's the thing. Good intentions aren't enough. I am here today because the strategies for scaling social change are teachable. The problem is we aren't teaching them. I know about this from my own story. This is me when I was 25, just a couple of years ago. I haven't changed, right? <laughs> I was a young lawyer in San Francisco, and I wanted to do something to help my own community. So I spent my days working at the law firm, and I spent my nights co-founding Spark with these amazing ladies. We were fighting for women's rights, and we were a network of young professionals. Spark was amazing. We had lines around the blocks for our events, we were doubling our revenue every few months, and we quickly became the largest network of millennial donors in the world. But just when we hit our stride, we hit a wall. We couldn't get the capital that we needed to scale past $500,000 in revenue. So a few years later, when I began teaching social entrepreneurship at Stanford, I became really curious. Who was scaling past that wall? What were they doing that we weren't doing at Spark? My research showed that the wall is real, that two-thirds of nonprofits in the United States are less than $500,000 in revenue. So I went out on a five-year mission to try to understand one question. Why is it that some social startups succeed and scale while others don't? I cared so much about this question that I literally gave birth to three children in three years and still did the work to try and answer it. I traveled the country and I surveyed hundreds of organizations. I sat down with 100 top social entrepreneurs with their leaders, with their teams, their beneficiaries, their staff and boards. And in those interviews, I kept waiting for someone to say, well, it's just charisma or a brilliant idea that gets people ahead. But no one said that. Now, that's not to say that charisma and grit and a brilliant idea aren't all important. Of course they are. But what I heard again and again is that the strategies for breakthrough success are a set of five essential practices that anyone can learn. First, testing ideas. Before you go out and raise money or get media attention, no business would launch its product before first testing it, and no nonprofit should either. Second, measuring impact right from the start and using those metrics, not just to prove that what you're doing is working, but to improve as you grow. 
Third, fundraising experimentation. If you're going to get involved in social change work, let me tell you, you're going to be doing a lot of fundraising. <laughs> the best organizations figure out how to raise money from both earned income and philanthropic sources. Fourth, leading collectively and tapping into the talents of your entire team. No one can do this work alone. It's got to be a team effort. And finally, storytelling in compelling ways that draws people into your movement. Create storytelling is really hard. Just ask any of the speakers who have been up on this stage today. I've been practicing my speech for weeks. <laughs> These five essential strategies make up the playbook that I wish I had when we co-founded Spark. It's the playbook that my students have been asking me for for years. And if we want to get better at scaling social change, we need to do a better job of sharing these lessons with our students, with our donors, and with nonprofit leaders themselves. First, we need to educate students. This is Rob Gitten. Rob was so passionate about the homeless kids that he volunteered with as an undergraduate. He got together with one of his classmates and started an organization in San Francisco called At the Crossroads. Rob was doing the work that he loved, helping homeless kids one by one by one, when he realized that there were thousands of kids who needed his help. Rob needed to build a movement, but he was only 22. He needed an army of people to help him, but he had never hired or managed before. He didn't have contacts to help him raise millions of dollars. And he hated the thought of turning his clients into data points, but he knew that he had to measure the impact of his work. Today at the Crossroads is a $2 million organization serving hundreds of homeless youth annually. But it took Rob 20 years of learning these lessons on the job to get there. And a few gray hairs along the way, as you can see. <laughs> Rob's story is the story of so many young people I've met who get into nonprofit work and realize they have very few tools in their toolkit to solve the challenges that nonprofits bring. Meanwhile, our sector, which is already so starved for resources, is wasting money while young people learn these lessons on the job. Now, education is changing for the better. Today, there are over 300 social entrepreneurship programs globally in universities. That means that students are getting on-the-job training in the classroom. At the program on social entrepreneurship at Stanford, where I teach, I co-teach my class with seasoned social entrepreneurs. These entrepreneurs give my students first-hand lessons about the challenges of nonprofit work. One of our nonprofit leaders took a group of my students to Juvenile Hall to visit with a group of girls there. When my students sat down with these girls, they realized how little they understood about their lives. Originally, my students had wanted to develop a program to help them apply for college. But when they met them, they realized that the application process was the least of their worries. These young girls needed jobs. They needed housing. They needed better academic preparation. By actually sitting down with the people that my students were trying to help and listening to them, my students realized you cannot design a solution without first deeply understanding the problem. This is a lesson that will serve my students for life. But we shouldn't be waiting until college to teach these lessons. 26% of teens say that they're already volunteering, and 60% of teens say they want their jobs to impact the world. We need to prepare to turn that passion into impact. Last year, a school shooting killed 17 people at Stoneman Douglas High School. And the students of Parkland, Florida, quickly captured the hearts and minds of people all over the world. They were advocating on national TV for gun control. They were in the halls of the US Congress lobbying. They sat down in the White House with President Trump. And these students were successful in getting huge companies like Walmart to stop selling guns. What people don't realize about these students is they were successful because they were prepared. 
Broward County, Florida has one of the largest debate programs in the country, teaching students skills like how to research, how to defend an argument, how to win a mock trial, starting as early as elementary school. When tragedy struck, it wasn't just their passion, but their training that allowed these students to spark one of the greatest youth movements of their time. While schools are in a great position to educate the next generation of donors, we also need to educate donors who are ready to give right now. <clears throat> Companies are in a great position to do just that. Now, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Millennials care about more than just themselves. 55% <laughs> of millennials say that a company's social cause was a critical factor in deciding whether to accept a job. And 97% of millennials say that they want to apply their professional skills to volunteering. 97%. Companies need to listen to that. Last year, Google donated $10 million to Goodwill, a job training organization, to help them train one million people in technical skills. But they didn't just give their money, they also committed the time of 1,000 of their employees to help with things like career coaching and technical skills trainings. Companies need to realize that they can't just invest their one-off volunteer days, they also have to invest their expertise in the causes that they care about. Companies are also in a great position to model what philanthropic giving looks like. Last year, wildfires struck Northern California, leaving hundreds of families with nothing. Big tech companies like Salesforce and Twilio joined forces with an established community foundation, Tipping Point community, to organize a concert, and to raise $33 million for nonprofits on the ground that were serving the victims. Companies must realize it's not just the right thing to do to give back to the community, it's also the smart thing to do. Customers want to buy products from values-driven companies, and employees want to work places where they feel proud. Finally, we must all do a better job, not just investing in the nonprofit programs that we care about, but in the incredible leaders who run them. Now, there's this trend in the United States where donors are refusing to pay for overhead costs, things like operational expenses, salaries, executive coaching. These are called restricted grants, and by some estimates, 80% of philanthropy in the United States is restricted. So what does this mean? Let me give you an example. Let's say that you walk into the restaurant and you want to buy some food. And you say, uh, yeah, I'll pay for the food, but I'm not going to pay for the chef's time to prepare it or the server's time to bring it to me, and I'm definitely not paying for the electricity to keep the lights on while I eat it. That sounds crazy, right? <laughs> we would never do that. But the nonprofit sector is one of the only places where investors feel entitled to pick and choose what they pay for. We say, uh, yeah, I'll pay for the program that teaches the kid to read, and uh, maybe I'll pay for the teacher's time in the classroom, but I'm not going to pay for the time that it takes to prepare the lesson, and I'm definitely not going to pay to figure out whether that lesson was successful. We are asking our nonprofit leaders, the people who have dedicated their entire lives to solving some of the most difficult challenges of our time, to fight these battles with one hand tied behind their backs. We pay them less, we question their investment in overhead, we give them more misguided donations than useful skills and expertise, and then we scratch our heads and we ask them, what's taking you so long to change the world? Foundations must do a better job of investing in the capacity of nonprofit organizations. Right here in China, the Ginkgo Foundation is doing just that, supporting social entrepreneurs not just with unrestricted grants, but with leadership development support. Guan Weibin founded Shoulder Action to bring books to kids in rural China. 
his NGO salary was so low that he almost had to quit because his mom was getting sick and he couldn't afford to pay for her care. When he got the support of the Ginkgo Foundation, not only was he able to pay himself a decent salary, he was supported by a network of fellow social entrepreneurs who helped him thrive. Today, Shoulder Action has provided kids all over China with millions of books in 30 provinces. Donors must realize that while it may feel good to give a kid a book or to uh, teach a kid to read, it's not enough if you aren't supporting the infrastructure to make those things happen. We all care about making a difference. You wouldn't be here today if you didn't. And with all of the new wealth and success that we have seen in China over the past several years, this country has the potential to be the next great philanthropic powerhouse. Yeah. <laughs> Just a couple of weeks ago, Jack Ma said that he is stepping down as executive chairman of Alibaba to dedicate 100% of his time on philanthropy. This is huge. But we also need to prepare to match those desires to make an impact with the education required to actually make an impact. Imagine a world if the kids of Parkland, Florida, who sparked that gun control movement, were given skills like fundraising and innovation and leadership so that they could scale their efforts over the next several years as opposed to learning those lessons on the job. A world where nonprofits didn't have to spend desperately needed operating expenses clearing away useless donations. A world where we invest not just in the programmatic success of nonprofits, but in the personal success of the leaders who run them. Look, this work is really, really hard. If it were easy, we'd be sitting back talking about that time when we solved world hunger. <laughs> we're not there yet. We must be prepared to match the passion that we are seeing for social change with the essential skills that are necessary to create impact. That is what turns good intentions into tangible results. That is what turns feel-good philanthropy into real good for the most vulnerable among us. The problems we face in this world are simply too big to wait. Thank you. Thank you.